It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Major General Stephen Day. And Stephen has been awarded for his service in the Army the Distinguished Service Cross. And you don't get to see many of them. But Stephen is the Deputy Director of Cyber and Information Security from the Australian Signals Directorate. And I think that's probably on the screen behind me. Steve, welcome to the University of Canberra. It's a real pleasure that you've been able to join us today. As many of you would know, the aim of the National Security Lecture Series is for students, staff and alumni from the University of Canberra, plus interested members of the public and members of the defence and diplomatic communities to hear from leading defence and security experts, and Steve is one of them. What is interesting is that Steve's responsibilities deal with a new and potentially very challenging aspect of national security. And for those students who have been studying it in the last two years, it's national security and cyber security and how they go together. And I'm thrilled that Steve's been able to come because so far in this lecture series over the last few years, we've heard from many of the leaders of our security and particularly our intelligence communities the Office of National Assessments, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, the Defence Intelligence Organisation, the Australian Crime Commission, and the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, plus the Deputy Secretary of Intelligence and Security from the Department of Defence. I think it's remarkable that so many of the most senior officers from our security and intelligence agencies are prepared to speak on the record about their roles and responsibilities. And to me, that's an excellent statement of transparency and openness of our intelligence services. Of course, they won't tell us everything that they know, and we shouldn't expect that. But at least by coming into the public sphere, and today coming to the University of Canberra, they've shown a real honesty and a concern for the public interest. So a double thank you for coming, Steve. A very brief introduction. I've mentioned Steve uh, wears uh, with good cause the Distinguished Service Cross, but he's not just an intelligence officer, he's not a geek, uh, very much far from that. He's, uh, as an engineer, has a very enviable operational record of service in the Australian Army. As a combat engineer, he served in Namibia, East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan. So Steve, welcome to the University of Canberra and I invite you to address the audience. Professor Peter, thank you very much, and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you. Peter asked me, um, I think about two months ago, if I would uh, come and do this presentation. And as my uh, former boss, there was really only one answer to that question, which was yes. And it's great to uh, be back in partnership with you uh, for this afternoon. Um, I, I presume everyone can hear me. I've got the, the microphone on. If you can't at the back, let me know. There are some familiar faces. Um, I come to you with four ideas, but the first thing you need to know is that I am an ordinary garden variety soldier. I have no special expertise in cyber. And as I will argue in a moment, I actually think that's an advantage. That said, the thoughts I do have are based on some tangential experience of cyber in operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, plenty of long hours of uh, discussion, thought and study, and of course the experience of my current appointment. Uh, now these are my views. So if I hit any sour notes, the responsibility is mine and mine alone. These are the four ideas I want to put to you. You should understand cyber as a means, not an end. Cyber war will not occur in and of itself, but activities through cyber will be employed in conjunction with other forms of coercion. The third idea is that the espionage threat to cyber, sorry, to Australia through cyber is real, it is persistent and it is present now. And the final thing I want to talk about is that although there is much to be done to deal with this threat. Some of the government's initiatives are starting to have an impact. Let me take each of these ideas in turn. 
Now, for many people, cyber is like a puff of smoke. It's sort of hard to get your hands around. Um, here's how I like to think about it. I like to think about it as a vector. Now, the analogy of air as a vector works for some, so let me use that one. You can fly people through the air to get them from point A to point B, so from the top left to the top right. You can transport medicine and food through air to achieve humanitarian outcomes. You can drop leaflets through air to prosecute an information campaign. Munitions and other projectiles could be transmitted through it to wreak their destructive force on distant targets. The point is it's not, at least in this analogy, about the air itself. It is a vector through which we can and indeed do achieve much. With cyber, it's not so much about cyber itself, but it is cyber as a vector that matters. It's what you can achieve through it that matters. Through it, you can control ships at sea. You can run an entire mining operation from a warehouse in Perth Airport, 1,500 kilometres from where the mine is, and that occurs. You can use it to prosecute psychological operations, like a lot of teenagers do when they use Facebook. You can use it to interdict a nuclear program. I, I, I think, at least I hope, you get the picture. The analogy breaks down a bit with air when we look at it like this. Air is a natural and a naturally existing vector. Of course, cyber is made by us, by humans. It is made of networks. Now, the significant majority of those networks are connected to the internet, although some of the most important ones are not. Because it is a people-made vector, it requires people to maintain it, to improve it, to expand it. In impolite company, we describe the group of people that do that as geeks. They are the builders and the maintainers. They also go by the name IT professionals. Now, one of the common traps that I have seen us all fall into is that we view cyber as a domain of IT professionals. Now, if I can go back to the air analogy. Um, environmental scientists might be the sort of people who, who work for us to try and keep the air healthy, to try and look after the vector. But there's no way we would use or leave environmental scientists to work out the future of air travel or to design military campaigns through air. And nor should we leave the possibilities that can be achieved through the vector of cyber to IT professionals. Essential though they are to its very existence and well-being. I, I invite you to think, therefore, of cyber as a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. You can leave the refreshing, the maintaining, the expanding of cyber to IT professionals. But the ends you need to leave to others. And in the national security space, that means policy makers and operators have to get involved. And if you are a policy maker or an operator, you need to understand the vector. So you're going to have to do some homework. I've been struggling to get this idea through to some of my colleagues. And whenever, for example, we discuss personnel to fill cyber positions, the organisation defaults to IT specialists or communications specialists. So I've got a bit of work to do. But an organisation that does not understand 
that policy makers and operators need to understand and be involved in cyber will struggle to realise the full potential that this vector offers. And those that do realise that can probably accrue a strategic edge. So at the risk of belabouring the point, my first point is those in the national security space need to understand cyber as a vector. IT professionals will maintain it, but policy makers and operators must attend to its, its vision and its, and its opportunities. Can I now move on to my second idea? One of the more important of those possibilities, which attracts plenty of attention at the moment, is the prospect of cyber war. And I have two recently published books on the topic. Hello. So I've actually got them here. This one by, by Richard Clark, a former White House National Security Advisor, says, cyber war, the next great threat to national security. It's written by an American. And this one, written by Thomas Ritt, an Englishman, cyber war will not take place. Well, I suppose titles are about attracting attention and, uh, and attracting buyers. But you know, each of those titles does reasonably sum up the key points the two authors are making. Richard Clarke's real purpose uh, is to build awareness of the threat and to get policy makers to do something about it. Thomas Ridd's real purpose is to reduce the hype around cyber and to invoke a more sober conversation. Um, I, I think both intents are sensible. And so ironically, I actually think both of them are right. While cyberspace may be a revolutionary phenomenon, it does not mean that our existing understanding of nation state behaviour is redundant. We are not starting with a blank slate here. Some who try to reconcile cyber with the definitions that are common to physical force forget that war is a human and not a technological experience. War fighting is essentially a human endeavour waged between complex human organisations. The, the conflict and any resulting action only arises when there is dissonance between human organisations. Now war and warfare have an unchanging nature but a highly variable character. The advent of the cyber domain should be seen as part of the variation in character. In other words, cyberspace has extended the battlefield. It has added to land, sea and air. It's another space through which operations can be prosecuted. So it is best understood as a new but not an entirely separate component of the spectrum of conflict. Operations through cyber, uh, sabotage or deception for example, are just one of the many options available to nation states or organised non-state actors as well. And at least for nation states, cyber capabilities are likely to be employed in conjunction with other forms of coercion. Just like in Afghanistan, we build diplomatic leverage, we use financial leverage, and we've used land and air forces all together to try and achieve our strategic ends. Cyber will be part of that picture in the future. Indeed, it is already, in some cases, part of that picture today. So, at least in my judgment, there will be no such thing as cyber war, but activities through it will be a feature of future wars. The real 
and present threat for us though is espionage through cyber. And, and it is to this threat that I now want to turn and focus the rest of my presentation. Espionage through cyber has been practiced by state and state-sponsored actors for at least a decade. Its purpose, like espionage throughout the ages, is to obtain knowledge of the intent of the other nation state. It is to accrue a strategic advantage or it is used to appropriate intellectual property. Now let me be clear that in Australia today, this threat is real, it has real consequences, it is persistent and it is present now. <coughs> In 2009, our government decided to do something against this threat. And they decided to establish the Cyber Security Operations Centre. Now that centre was stood up in the Defence Signals Directorate in 2010. The CSOC, which is what we call the Cyber Security Operations Centre, is focused on uh, defeating sophisticated threats against Australia through cyber. And from the first day it opened, the CSOC has been in a daily struggle against them. The next couple of slides uh, might give you a bit of a feel for what we're seeing. So the vertical axis uh, represents the number of incidents and the horizontal axis is time. Each block is, is a month. The blue bars are for the year 2011 the red for 2012 and the green are for last year. You will notice that the trend is increasing year on year. In 2012, the figure increased by 41% from the preceding year and last year we saw an increase of 21%. Now, I, th I think there are actually two explanations for the increases. Firstly, uh, there is probably an actual increase in the number of incidents, but I think the more significant factor is likely to be an improved ability on our behalf to detect them. Uh, this is a simple picture. What it does is, is provide you a breakup of who we attribute those actors to, or sorry, those, those uh, incidents to. You can see that the one that we are most familiar with are state-sponsored actors. You probably also know that there's a, notice there's a significant number of unknowns. We cannot attribute everyone. I tend to think, though, that the unknown element is roughly equivalent proportionally to the other three that we see. Now these adversaries, um, they seek defence and they seek national security information, but interestingly the targeting of commercial information is usually more preponderant. Um, in fact, we, we think that the majority of cyber intrusions do have an economic focus. Now those organisations and industries involved in leading edge research, and that includes universities, Those organisations and industries that provide leading edge capabilities to defence, those organisations are common targets. The cyber actors are predominantly seeking to steal intellectual property. Now the four most commonly targeted sectors that we see in no particular order are resources and energy, banking and finance, defence capability and telecommunications. Now there are others, but, but those are the top four. If an organisation is connected to the internet, it is vulnerable. And doing something about it is not something that you can just leave to your IT professionals. Now part of the solution to dealing with these threats is about software and hardware, which is where your IT professionals really uh, carry their own. But it's also about resources, it's about culture, and it's about risk management. 
So dealing with the threats through cyber is actually senior leader business. So what are we doing about it? Um, the first challenge for us has been to bring an awareness of the threat to ministers and senior officials. Now, for some years, we've been working, the Australian Signals Directorate, in partnership with the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation and the Attorney General's Department to get an understanding of this awareness. And my sense is that we've probably reached a tipping point in federal government. My judgment is that there are enough ministers and senior officials in enough departments of state that matter, that understand enough about the threat and know that we have to do something about it. I think we're beginning to see it emerge as part of the federal bureaucracy psyche. Uh, Cybersecurity in state governments, which we also have a responsibility for, uh, is somewhat more patchy. Uh, there are some who are at the very good end of the freeway and there are some who are at the opposite end as well. And what we've noticed is, is that something as simple as a change in a minister or a change in a senior official can have an extraordinary impact on the understanding of a state government uh, about the cyber threat. So we haven't reached a critical mass of understanding in the state governments yet. There are better judges than I about industry, but here's what I see. I think that there are some islands of excellence. I'd identify some big resource companies, uh, the big banks and the major telcos. But these um, folk exist in a, in a sea of comfortable ignorance. So the heavy lifting across our nation, at least in my view, is actually to be done with industry. The second challenge, having built up the awareness, is, is trying to offer some practical advice on what, on what you can do about it, and someone else with a camera, uh, on what you can do about it. Now, we, the CSOC, get out and help people, but um, our resources are finite. <coughs> We can't help everyone that needs to be helped. So our work has to be prioritised. Sensibly, uh, it's not up to us to determine our priorities. There is an organisation called the Cyber Security Operations Board, more on them in a minute. They prioritise our work for us. Now the board looks at those areas of government who have data or who prosecute activity of particular importance to our nation. They look at the security posture, the cyber security posture of those organisations, and they look at the attractiveness, both the track record and the likelihood of attractiveness for foreign intelligence services. So if you get a tick in the your important box and you get a cross against your cyber security <coughs> posture, and you are attractive to foreign intelligence services, congratulations, we will come knocking on your door to help. We also provide a surge of effort to select agencies in the lead up to particular events. Uh, for example, last year we uh, went and saw the Australian Electoral Commission uh, some months before the federal election to make sure they were set. And we will do the same uh, later this year uh, before, the, in fact we've already started, uh, in the lead up to the G20. That's something else we do. So how are we going? Well, we're just starting to get a sense that we're beginning to make a difference. As I showed you earlier, uh, the number of attempted intrusions against the Australian government is increasing, but the number of successful intrusions is not. There's an indicator. We had some 
pretty ordinary years, 2009 to 2012, uh, and we really don't have an adequate picture of what occurred before 2009. But the trend line of successful intrusions is going down. What about our next steps? Well, both this and the previous government have recognised the need to protect Australian networks from cyber threat. In January last year, the then Prime Minister identified cyber security as a key priority in the national security strategy. In fact, she came into the Defence Signals Directorate to launch the national security strategy. And it was more than just cyber, I might add. And in that, she announced the establishment of the Australian Cyber Security Centre. Now, this centre is the brightest light on our radar screen at the moment. Uh, its mission will be to lead the Australian Government's analysis of the cyber threat, to develop a shared situational awareness across a broad range of partners, government and industry, and international colleagues. <coughs> and we will also lead the national response to cyber <coughs> incidents, cyber incidents that are important. The Senate will be comprised of the key cyber capabilities that exist, and, and they're on the, and on the screen there, in, in ASIO, in ASD, the Computer Emergency Response Team out of Attorney General's Department, Australian Federal Police High Tech Crime Organisation will be there, as will the Australian, the, the ACC. Now, we will be housed in the new Ben Chifley building, the new headquarters of ASIO, um, and yesterday the building was officially handed over to the government. Big step, only a couple of years late. Um, now, we can't move in tomorrow. Uh, what we now have to do, and the Australian Cyber Security Centre will occupy about three floors there, uh, we've got to go in and do a significant technology fit out. That will probably take us about three months. Uh, so I expect that we'll be up and running and operational uh, around about the first half of December. That's what I'm planning on. Now, the centre is going to be governed by that body I mentioned before, the Cyber Security Operations Board. Now, the CSOP, as we call it, um, is a cross-government, secretaries-level board. It's not just about national security agencies. Communications are represented there. Finance are represented there, amongst others. The board is chaired by the Secretary of the Attorney-General's Department. And, and as the, the, the boss of the new centre, I answer to the chair of the board. In the event of an incident, um, as the coordinator, I am responsible for determining its severity. And that is determined against a set of agreed criteria, which has been developed by Prime Minister and Cabinet. And as necessary, my responsibility is to advise the chair of the CSOB about the problem. And I have a direct line of communication to him for that purpose. The chair is then in turn responsible to advise the national security uh, ministers. Now, this system is in place. It has been exercised and I can tell you it's working. Let me um, try and sum up uh, all that I've said. One, <clears throat> I invite you to think of cyber as a vector, as a means, not an end in of itself. IT professionals will look after it for you, but policy makers and operators need to own its possibilities. The militarisation of language around cyber, like cyber attack and cyber war, is masking the realities. Activities through cyber will be a feature of future conflict, but they will not replace it. There will not be a cyber war. 
Today, most of the activities through cyber that are affecting the national security space are better described as espionage or theft. The espionage threat to Australia is real, persistent and it is present now. There is much to be done in this space, but the government's efforts, and they've been significant over the last few years, are starting to have an effect. And let me conclude with some encouragement, if you like. As a professional soldier, I am used to looking at intellectual leadership uh, in other nations, particularly the US and Britain. Why? They've been at it for centuries. They've been more often successful than they've not. And they put a lot of money, a lot of resources into thinking and writing about the profession of arms. But when I put my radar screen out, do my horizon scanning for dealing with cyber security, I can't see a bright light out in front. When I look to my flanks, I see in Canada and the United States, they have some very good technological solutions. If I look to Northern Europe, they've got a very good handle on the threats coming out of Eastern Europe. If I look to the UK, they've got a very good outreach program with industry and actually academia. But no one seems to have gotten it all together. No one is actually doing it any better than us, us Australia that is. And I think partly it's because this is such a new part of the journey of human civilization. We're still trying to come to terms with it. No one's been at it or trying to understand it any longer than anyone else has. And so I find, as I, as I meet international partners, and I meet a lot, um, that we are actually on the edge of thinking and acting in cyber security. Now, we're not on our own. We're not on our own. But we can and we are looking at the situation through Australian eyes, coming up with Australian solutions, picking the best bits and pieces from around the world, but we're doing good. And I can tell you that uh, as the head of that new cyber security centre, I intend to keep us there. Thank you, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to take questions. David Wade, the, um, you're talking about benchmarking, and you're talking about benchmarking against our Western allies. Have you been able to, in any way, been able to benchmark yourselves against Russia or China or anybody else on, from the um, Asian area? Uh, yes. Um, they, they, not all of them are happy to talk to me, um, but. The CERT community, the com uh, computer emergency response team, that community is quite big, particularly in Asia, and they, uh, they swap notes. So the, sh the short answer is yes. We, we do have um, a, a fair bit more to do with, with our colleagues in Southeast Asia than we do with North Asia, though. And it, I guess there might be a follow-up question, so how are we going with, in comparison to them? It is the same answer that I, that I uh, sorry, the answer I offer you is the same when I look to benchmark against others. Thank you. Hi, my name's Geoffrey Barker, General. You talked a lot about the threat to Australia to the, uh, through, through um, intrusions on national security and uh, commercial intelligence, uh, in commercial information. Um, in seeking to counter that, to what extent is Australia, though, involved in its own intrusions and acting to prevent those to prevent those issues? Doesn't Australia have to also get into the business of actively seeking to steal intellectual property? Um, Are we virgins in this matter? 
I, I, obviously, uh, ASD is a foreign espionage organisation. Uh, if your question is, does Australia get, get involved in stealing intellectual property, that's your question? Well, it's the question of... You, 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 you talk sound as if we were sitting here um, passively being uh, attacked through the spectre, and, and we're not doing anything beyond trying to get... Don't, don't you have to get to the business of actively doing similar things yourself in order to protect information, to protect security? Oh, I see. So your question is, how do we go about protecting our, our, against the threat? Is that, is that your question? What can we do about ourselves joining that game? Absolutely. And that's how we do it. Interestingly, um, the, a lot of folks think that the way to deal with this is to actually get into, the, into cyber yourself and sort of push back. Well, you can do that, but that's really expensive. The, the efficient end of, of this mission is actually in prevention. It's also the most boring and it's the most tedious. But that's where I actually think uh, we, we're actually doing re really quite well. Now, um, some of you here, if you're involved in the game, will be aware of the mitigation strategies that the DSD has developed. Uh, there's about 35 of them. Uh, the top four of them will, um, if you implement them, and I can tell you what they are, um, will stop about 85% of the intrusion sets that we know that are out there. In fact, to, to prove it, we did an experiment. We uh, built 1,200 virtual machines, and through those machines, we ran 1,700 sets of badness. Some of it was the stuff you, you see out in the, in the wild of the internet. Some of it is the sophisticated stuff that, that we see. And what we then did to those 1,200 machines was we applied the top four in varying degrees. Now, now the top four is application whitelisting. It, it, we call it a catch-patch match. Application whitelisting means that you don't let any programs onto your system other than the list of ones that you've agreed to, which sort of reverses what goes on mostly. Patching. There are two sorts of patching. There's looking after your operating system and there's looking after the applications. So when you see Microsoft come and say, hey, there's an update, my advice to you, accept it. When you see um, one of the companies that provide an application for your system say there's an update, like Adobe, accept it, that's my advice. The fourth one, the fourth one is, sorry, yeah, the fourth one is matching. Now, what you'll find in, in big organisations is that there's more often than not a lot of people who've got what's known as administrative privileges. They can move around your entire network freely. Very few people need that authority. Now what um, intelligence services look for is who's got administrative privileges. That then allows them to move around freely. So if you do those four things, you will stop the vast majority of badness that's out there. Back to our experiment. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the, the machines were then applied to varying degrees with the top four. The, those machines that had the top four applied and properly applied, how many of those 1,700 badness uh, came through? The answer, none. Now, we, we don't like to say it's going to stop everything because we know it can't, but you can go a long way towards it. So what our main effort is building awareness, which I spoke about. Once you get people's attention, then you can offer them advice on how to deal with it. And it is that boring stuff that that's what gives you your best chance at cyber security. Right. Thank you. Um, I guess my question partly picks up on that last one and it relates to, I guess, norms and rules and principles. Um, I guess I'd be interested to hear to what extent you think Australia should look to deterrence measures um, and even counter-attack capability versus uh, a negotiated international framework to constrain government use of cyber weapons. 
Um, <clears throat> we're talking mostly about, you're talking about espionage? Well, I guess espionage isn't covered by any international you know, framework. So I, I guess to the extent we're talking about cyber as warfare, you know, we have rules that govern war. Um, and you know, there is a debate quite prominent in the US uh, about um, the relevance and applicability of existing rules. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, if you, you've talked about the cyber threat that we deal with, uh, going out into international forums and saying, hey, stop spying on us, we're not going to get very far. Um, if you're talking about it as part of the spectrum of conflict, um, what has been agreed by the international community and by Australia, and we, we had a prominent role, when I say we, it was uh, our diplomats in the United Nations, what has been agreed is that the, the, the norms of international law um, apply in cyber. That, 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 that as a principle has been agreed. The, the challenge for us is, is to understand how they apply. And that's, that's a conversation that's underway at the moment. Uh, my own views, very much my own, is that there are a, a, there's a significant body of law out there that seeks to regulate war, it seeks to, re to, to remove its excesses to the extent that you can. And my, as a soldier, I'm used to being given rules of engagement. Here are the conditions under which you can apply violence. Here are the factors that you have to consider. And I actually think um, the same mechanisms uh, can be adequately used for cyber. One of the things um, I've found in this game is that there's a lot of, I would call, overthinking the problem. Um, and so one of the things that I try and do is I, I try and keep it simple. And, and I think one of the points I made was that we're not starting from a blank slate here. There's actually quite a lot of what we already do, uh, both in law and norms of behaviours, that I think could be quite comfortably applied to what we do uh, in cyber. Owen Davies, chaplain here and in the Navy Reserve. God bless you, Chaplain. <laughs> Thank you, sir. God bless you too. <laughs> Tell us about the the human side of this. Um, we talked about the geeks before, and you clearly explained that we need more than geeks. What sort of skill sets are you looking for in people, and what do you see the role of universities in training and training equipping people for that? What does our nation need? Uh, <coughs> We need a nation of people that have got uh, good, decent, comfortable value set. It's probably not appropriate for a professional soldier to tell you what I think those values should be. Um, but that forms the basis of how we act. And it should apply with what we do in cyber. Um, I, I don't think that cyber is going to take us into new and dangerous areas. Um, as long as we think clearly and we keep it, uh, we, we keep international rules and international norms in our sites, I think we'll be okay. The, the harder part of the question though is actually what, are, what we need to do with academia. Here's what I see. So I, again, as a professional soldier and as a student, I, I look to academic publications, I look to universities for um, new ideas, concepts to help inform me. And I found it a wonderful resource over all of my career, until it came to cyber. And when I look at what gets produced in cyber, in academia, and I see what's practically going on in the world that I live in, there's a huge air gap. And I, so I'm not finding that reaching out to academia is helping at the moment. Um, and I think that's not surprising again, given how, in civilizational terms, how new this, this game is. So I think academia have got a little way to go. It behoves me not to stand and criticize, and I'm not, I'm making an observation, but someone who, who's, who's lucky enough to be involved practically to close that gap, to reach out to academia and to um, see if we can't uh, draw on the IQ of the nation to, to deal with this problem or this challenge. Um, currently I'm focused on 
trying to develop an engagement strategy for industry for the new centre, because as I said, I think that's where the heavy lifting is to be done. Um, once I've uh, wrestled that and I've got it underway, I will then turn my attention to an engagement strategy with academia. And that will be something that I will be able to produce by the end of next year. It's on my calendar anyway. Did, did, did I answer your question? Thank you, sir. Sir, Harold Jacobs. Um, the new game and the number of intrusions and detections you mentioned, uh, what's your personal feeling about what's been detected and the intrusions that have been reported? <clears throat> Are we looking at the tip of the iceberg or is there probably more out there and we're not smart enough and the opponents outsmart us? Thank you, Harold. Um, the, the CSOC, what we are focused on, are sophisticated actors predominantly targeting the federal government and um, some systems of national importance. So we've really focused on a, on a small part of, of the nation. I think um, that we're seeing the vast majority of what's going on and being able to prevent it. But I am not at all confident that we're seeing everything. Not at all confident. Um, one of the things that we, we've come to learn is that you often don't know that someone's been successful until quite a period of time afterwards. Sometimes uh, uh, measured in years, but more usually measured in, in months. So I could stand here now and say, you know, we've had a pretty good year this year. Uh, nothing's occurred and then tomorrow find out that actually for the first three months of the year there, there was a problem. Um, but across the nation there's a vast uh, amount of um, activity that goes on that no one's uh, looking at. And to get back to Mr Barker's point, um, I don't think we ever will have sensors all around the nation to pick up every sort of badness that comes in. And that's why investment in prevention is, is in my view, more important and the most efficient thing to do. So um, we're seeing the tip of activity, but it's also, I think, the important tip. There is a, a big berg under that, and we've got to do something about that as well, though. Thank you. If you'd like to take a seat, seat I'll uh, say a few words of thanks. Thank you, Peter. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, and thanks for answering the questions in such a clear manner. Uh, I think you got away with it. You, your bosses won't be coming hunting you this afternoon. Uh, when you work in jobs like this, it can be pretty hard. Uh, Steve has tried his hardest uh, to be frank and honest and transparent. And I think you've achieved that. So thank you for that. Thank you for coming to the University of Canberra. But also, uh, as I look around the room with uh, past national security students and some who are going to start studying next week, I think you've given a really clear idea of the importance of the policy and the coordination, the fact that it is that vector, but it's a happening at either end. And that's what we're trying to do here at the university, make those people who will be worried about the resources, who will be worried about the policy, who consider the national security implications, uh, and you gave us a very clear view of that. So thank you. As someone who's about to teach national security, I'm thrilled with what you've done this afternoon. You know it's being recorded, and it'll be up on our webpage very soon. But I think the other thing from a university point of view, and I thank the Padre for asking the question, what can we do to help? Uh, we're a university. Uh, we're here in the national capital where a lot of this is happening. And I think uh, as well as providing the IT professionals a much politer way of saying the word than geek, but we can help with the development of those people who work at the policy and the coordination end. And I think that's a challenge for the university. Uh, how can we do that? And I see one of our very senior university officials in the room today. I think we'll take that challenge on and we do look forward to taking up your offer of working with you in the future as we're a national level university here in Canberra. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to thank Major General Stephen Day.